Uh, this evening, it's my pleasure to be able to uh, welcome to the podium Dr. Henry Gilbert, who will be talking about a species that falls in between Homo erectus. Dr. Gilbert is actually one of the world's leading authorities on this species, this very, very important species that was a precursor to Homo sapiens. Dr. Gilbert has a very interesting academic history. He was born in San Francisco. He was raised on a farm in Northern California. And he started his college career, his academic career, at a little-known Western University, California Polytechnic State, San Luis Obispo, actually. Uh, he, he started out as an agricultural engineer. Uh, he took a class from a member of our faculty in the social sciences department, Dr. Patrick McKim, who's here in the audience today. Pat, raise your hand. Um, Henry took a class from Dr. McKim called Sex, Death, and Human Nature. And it sparked an interest in him in evolutionary psychology. And it basically changed Henry's life forever. Um, he transferred the following year to UC Santa Barbara, where he received a BA in anthropology in 1994. He went on immediately to graduate school at UC Berkeley. Uh, during his first year of graduate studies at Berkeley, he conducted three and a half months of paleoanthropological field work in Ethiopia. And he has been going to the field every year since then. Uh, he received, finally finished his PhD in integrative biology at UC Berkeley in 2003. He's accumulated a very impressive academic resume since that time. He's published two books. One of them is a tremendously important, if not the most uh, distinguished, volume on Homo erectus. It was published by the University of California Press in 2008. He's published over 33 scholarly articles in the world's leading paleoanthropological journals, including Nature and the Journal of Human Evolution. Um, he is currently a professor, assistant professor of anthropology at CSU East Bay, and he also holds a joint appointment here as a researcher at UC Berkeley. So I think that's enough for me. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming to the podium our former Cal Poly student, Dr. Henry Gilbert. Thanks for the nice introduction there. You guys are all missing Ann Coulter. I don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> you're in the right place, right? Okay, so uh, tonight we're gonna be talking about what does come in between that early stuff that you might hear about when you come in April and the diaspora of Homo sapiens. Um, it's actually a complicated time. A lot of stuff happens in between those two things. And so I'm gonna try to present a whole bunch of information to you guys. A little bit of it is gonna be technical. Um, hopefully it won't be too technical, so it's not like a school class or anything like that. Um, but uh, a little bit of it will be. And so we'll get the ball rolling. We'll talk about Homo erectus. We'll talk about what it is as a species. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the study of Homo erectus. And we'll also talk a little bit about archeology span and the tools. And uh, anybody heard of the Asha land? Homo erectus is famous for the Asha land. And, uh, there's actually a story to be told about the way that uh, Homo erectus uses tools and the sort of global distribution of Homo erectus and how it changes over time that you don't really read about too much in textbooks. So hopefully you guys will get a new slice of information that you haven't had before and have a little good visual imagery as well. So we're going to be talking about species, right? Has anybody ever heard of a species? Everybody's heard of a species. Does anybody know what a species is? What is a species? Right? No? Hmm. I mean, usually people kind of think of species as things that are reproductively isolated from other species, right? You can reproduce, then you're a species. If you can't, then you're not. But there's all kinds of weird examples uh, that we can cook up, not in a laboratory, but in corrals and in captivity, where things that we thought were species really don't behave a lot like species. There's ligers, zonkeys, right? <laughs> a zorse, right? It's not that much of a surprise because donkeys and zebras are actually related, so it's like it would work pretty well. Savannah cat, how about that one? It's a serval and a domestic cat, and they are legal in case you guys are interested in having a cool domestic cat that's not really totally domestic. In fact, cats will cross with a lot of different small cat species. There, there are actually not a lot of reproductive barriers between that whole group. 
uh, wolf Odi, right? Of course, dogs and wolves can reproduce, but so can coyotes and wolves, and dogs and coyotes, of course, can reproduce. If you look at the DNA in coyotes around the LA basin, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of domestic dog DNA. Um, they reproduce just fine. Uh, a growler bear, we'll talk about this one in a little bit. You guys have seen it in uh, National Geographic, they called it a spirit bear, right? But polar bears and grizzly bears haven't been separated that long. In fact, you can argue that they're not really even separated now. There's all these little hybrid communities along the interface. Comma, right? And that's a weird one because camels and llamas have been separated by a really long time, but they reproduce readily, right? Okay, so, um, you know, you might wonder if species are real, yet when you go out in nature and you walk around and you look at the different animals, you see these different discrete groups. Species really are real, right? And all it takes is a walk outside. You know, you can walk outside and look at the different plants and animals and you'll see that there's different classes and they don't really reproduce. Um, I guess, the best definition is that, that biological definition. And it turns out that at some point, you know, the lion lineage and the tiger lineage are going to reach a point when they don't reproduce anymore, right? And so there is something true to this, this reproductive isolation, right? Um, but the issue of species is quite confusing. In fact, if you go to biological literature, you'll find that there are a lot of different possible species concepts. They all are kind of similar, right? But um, just to give you an example, asexually reproducing animals. What's a species in an asexually reproducing group, right? They don't have reproductive boundaries. It doesn't make sense to think about them. Each different animal is a different lineage, right? So there's a lot of sort of subtlety and there's a lot of different definitions of species. You can see that I've just scrolled through a whole bunch of them. But at the end of the day, you do have different kinds of things, right? At the end of the day, species are kind of real, right? At the end of the day, and hopefully my clicker will work here, um, species are real. Doggone it, we're going to scroll through that whole thing again. So anyway, you get to see all the different species once again. Um, what you see is that uh, when you start to really try to define a species, it doesn't end up being uh, something that's quite as crisp as what you see when you go out there and walk around. So we'll let this guy scroll through and let that dog and cat come in. And then kind of the point that I want to make, though, at the end of this slide, is that there really are these things called species, right? Now, think about how we might test those things in the fossil record, though. And that's something that is... Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to see that you can't take two fossils and then see whether or not they're going to be able to make babies, right? Now, the story of species in the human fossil record obviously starts with the first, uh, the first actually recognized human fossil. Now, um, it turns out that there were a couple of different Neanderthal crania discovered before the first recognized Neanderthal cranium, but the first one that was recognized to be something of interest was the Neanderthal cranium from the Neanderthal Valley in Germany, really close to Dusseldorf, and it was found in 1856. And the school teacher who was first brought to said, oh, that's something that's really interesting. And if you look at what was happening historically in the late 1700s and early 1800s, there are a lot of people looking for sort of evolutive uh, ideas for how humans got there. Uh, for how humans got here. And you'll see people looking for early evidence of humans, even in the late 1700s, right? They didn't quite have the mechanism of evolution down, but there were a lot of people looking. And so there were a lot of people that were saying, you're never ever gonna find any human fossils at that time, right? And so when these things got found, generally speaking, the way that they would be written off is by saying, you know, this is just a pathological human. And that's definitely what happened when we first see the Neanderthal cranium brought to somebody who was considered a very prominent authority, Verschau in Germany, and he said, uh, you remember when those Cossack warriors were around and they had big old faces and they looked weird and they were barbaric? Well, it's probably one of those things, and maybe it was diseased or something that kind of added to the barbaric look of it, but it probably isn't anything all that special, and everybody kind of bought it, right? But the first Neanderthal cranium was discovered before Darwin's Origin of Species came out. And when the Origin of Species came out, it was, it was, the world was really ready for it, or at least a segment of the world. It's like people had been trying to come up with ideas for this pattern that they'd been able to see. Paleontologists were drawing pictures of you know, evolving lineages and things like that. So when Darwin finally hit, it made a big splash. And you see Homo neanderthalensis getting named after the Origin of Species is published. And when it gets named, the ape-like the ape-like features of this thing are really emphasized, right? And so it's almost like it's a counter to what is being said by these big anatomists. Now, 
there's a big argument, right, as you might imagine, but of course, that's not the only human fossil that gets discovered. And later in the 1800s and 1886, they find a couple of these things. They find two different Neanderthal skeletons, and they both got crania, and both of the crania look the same. And so these people that were saying that it was a pathological individual were not, you know, nobody's listening to them anymore. So um, by the late 1800s, you have people that are starting to realize that these fossils are real. And you'll see that there's a twist that happens later on where people start to go, okay, evolution's real, but you know, we're still not too comfortable with how close this brings us to animals, right? Now, in the late 1800s, the first Homo erectus skeleton, is already, the first Homo erectus skull, there's also a femur and a couple of other bits, but it's really the skull that makes a big splash. The first one is found, right? And of course, the first thing to compare it to is Neanderthals, and it's a lot smaller than Neanderthals, right? It's distinctively, I mean, you can really tell how different it is, and right away, you get people saying, ah, well, now we've really got the thing figured out. We've got Pithecanthropus from uh, Eastern Eurasia, and then we've got Neanderthals, and then we've got humans. It all makes this nice sequence. A lot of people were uncomfortable with that, right? And it's almost like you see this transition in the same school of those Virchow type uh, anatomists who were trying to say, no, this is something patho pathological, kind of shifting over and saying, well, okay, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, maybe it's real, but you know what? It's really way far separated from us. And this is when we get the first games being played with species in the human fossil record, because that's what it is. They're trying to say, look, there's humans really far separated from this other group. Now, um, what you see in the early part of the 20th century is a whole bunch of Neanderthal discoveries in France. And the way that they're portrayed is as these like hairy beasts, kind of the way that you see Australopithecus uh, displayed these days. And so they really kind of emphasized how non-human these guys were. And uh, at the same time, in England, you had a group that was also of the same idea that uh, Homo sapiens was really different from this other lineage of ape men. And then that's, of course, when you have the Piltdown fossil entering the game. And the Piltdown fossil is really uh, important because if you look at what it is, um, it's got a couple of features that mix primitive and derived stuff in a way that was exactly what the people that were promoting this expected, right? Because what you see with Neanderthals and with Homo erectus is that, well, Neanderthals are actually not all that much different from us in terms of cranial capacity, but Homo erectus is a small brain, right? And what these people were expecting is that the brain was the thing that was, that drove human evolution, right? That the brain was the thing that happened first and then all the other stuff, our behavior, walking upright, all this stuff is what we did because we were so smart, right? And that's kind of the way that, that, that people had presented what they would expect a human ancestor to be like. It would look like an ape with a gigantic brain, right? And so that's what they thought was gonna be there for Piltdown or for, for the stuff that came before humans and that's exactly what they found with Piltdown, which of course, was an orangutan jaw and a human cranium that had been buried. And you know, there's all kinds of details. If you wanna, if you wanna see who did it, there's a lot of, uh, it's kind of like a murder mystery, right? There's a great video that you can watch and there's sort of a, um, oh, hit the internet and you'll see all sorts of different stuff on this, but it's a big fraud, right? And it's a fraud that fits right into what was being expected, especially in England by that time. Okay, so. Um, the first named African species, first named species in Africa is from Broken Hill, um, which is now Zambia. Uh, it was named Homo rudisiensis in 1921. Um, and at this time when it was published, you started having people say, oh look, there's a Neanderthal phase in Africa, therefore Piltdown not real, right? And that sort of notion is starting to pick up. Now, one of the things that you see in paleoanthropology happen a lot, um, first of all, how long ago it was 150 years ago? It's really not that long ago, right? I mean, in our lifetimes, it's sort of long, but it's like our grandparents' grandparents were alive at that time, right? And that's when all this stuff started. So this hasn't even been around for the amount of time that algebra has or anything like that. And so all this stuff is brand new, right? As like you guys are getting it, it's only 150 years old. And so what happens is that you find a few fossils, all the big shots get together and come up with hypotheses and ideas about that. And then a whole bunch of new fossils get found and it's not like the questions get answered, they just look stupid, right? The questions that were asked before are all of a sudden just irrelevant, right? And that sort of starts to happen because during the 1920s and 30s, people find zillions of Homo erectus fossils, right? Uh, in Guangdong, 1932, there's a whole bunch of them. Chokutian in China in the 1930s and, uh, excuse me, 1920s and uh, 30s. Sangaron, they're also finding them in the 30s. Um, another thing that happens in the 1920s is that the Tong child is found. The Tong child has a real small cranium 
and really kind of human-like teeth, and that's very different. It's kind of the opposite of what Piltdown was, right? Piltdown is still being promoted as a really important fossil that shows that humans have a deep disconnection from all this other stuff that they're finding and leaves the human origins kind of ambiguous, which is comfortable for a lot of people. If you look at the way Louis Leakey presented things in the 1930s, what you'll see is that he saw a deep divergence between Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and all this other stuff, and modern humans, right? Which he thinks that Piltdown is a pretty clear ancestor of. And if you look at the way that you know, it was portrayed, everything is a different lineage. All the different races of Homo sapiens are different lineages. Every new fossil found is a different lineage, all the different groups. And that's kind of the way that people perceive stuff, right? It's kind of not right, right? We know that that's not the way things are, but that was the way that it was perceived. And when people found new fossils, they just kind of automatically assumed that it was a new species, right? Any biologists out there? Yes. We're all biologists, come on, biology's cool. Biology is sociology. Um, so one of the things that was happening in biology when Darwin was thinking about uh, how speciations occur, he'd think of things like rivers running through and splitting a species apart and the two different animals on both sides going in different directions. Population genetics really takes off in the early 20th century, and people start to discover some things about the way speciations occur. They don't necessarily always occur when a river cuts between things. You can have speciations occur where there's gene flow between the two different groups, right? In fact, speciations are pretty complicated. There's times when you can have speciations occurring in cichlid fish in Africa when they're in the same lake, right? And they just sort of uh, morph on to different feeding niches, right? But they're in the same place. Um, so people started to realize that speciation is kind of a complicated thing in the 1920s. And Ernst Meyer later on is going to say, you paleoanthropologist, you know, you find a new fossil, you name a new species, and you're not even paying attention to biology at all, right? Anyway, during the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, you start to see people really understanding more about speciation, and it spills over into not paleoanthropology so much early on, but into paleontology, right? And so you start to get a lot of people publishing stuff about how you recognize species in the fossil record. So this is kind of a picture of what uh, uh, Meyer envisioned speciations to generally look like. Not necessarily reproductive isolation, but a distribution that limits gene flow in areas where you have disruptive selection, right? Where you have differences in natural selection. And if the gene flow is small enough, you'll get a speciation whether or not there's gene flow there or not, right? Anyway talk about that again in a second. This leads to an idea of an evolutionary species, right? And think about that. So you've got a biological species that works in one slice of time, okay? Where you have the boundaries defined reproductively, but clearly things have a time dimension as well. And so a species kind of has a shape across time, if you want to think about it in one way, and that's the evolutionary species concept. This thing sort of is first published in the 1950s, but it's really the culmination of all those 20s, 30s, 40s ideas about speciation. So an evolutionary species concept is considering a time depth to a kind of like a biological species, although, of course, when you're looking in the fossil record, you can't see those reproductive boundaries. So Ernst Meyer is the one who is responsible for the first uh, sort of synthesis of all these different species or all these things that people were calling species into Homo erectus, right? And so that's when we first start to see Homo erectus as a concept emerging, right? So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit, although it's gonna continue on a temporal line. Now, recognizing species in the fossil record would seem like after that spiel that I gave you to be really difficult, if not impossible. Um, but something happens during the 50s and 60s uh, that shows you a way that you can actually see different lineages in the fossil record. And it has something to do with time. So we'll point out my friend Garnus Curtis, who's still alive in Berkeley here, who first uh, publishes uh, potassium argon dating in 1956, promptly dates all the North American land mammal fossils, and then goes to Olduvai Gorge and dates all the Olduvai Gorge fossils at bed one in Olduvai Gorge in 1958, published in 1959, Louis Leakey finds Australopithecus boisei, Zinjanthropus boisei. So he finds Zinj, um, and he also finds tools. Now, he interpreted that this thing is closer to Homo. Remember that picture that Louis Leakey had? It turns out he was trained by one of the people that were involved in the Piltdown hoax, right? So he's definitely of the mind that Homo sapiens has these deep roots, and he took it to his grave, right? He took it all the way to his grave. Um, 
suggested that it's closer to Homo, and um, lo and behold, there were also tools that were buried along with the stuff at Olduvai Gorge. Really quickly afterwards, though, uh, a different species is found in the same beds. Uh, Homo habilis is found in the same beds in bed one of Olduvai Gorge, and they're really, really different in the way that they look. Um, there's a one that was found later, but there's really not that much of a question that you've got two different things co-occurring, and the fact that you have them in the same place uh, is really pretty good evidence that you've got two different lineages. And it turns out that there are several places that have these two different types of things co-occurring. There's multiple different sites, and so we have a real good idea that there's two different lineages here, right? Two different species. That's about as good as it gets in the fossil record. There's numerous different places where you find this. Um, one of the best ones, hopefully we're gonna get there, um, Conso is a more recently found one. Probably the best of these guys is Omo. And the reason why Omo is so good is because at this locality in Ethiopia, there's a whole bunch of different stratigraphic layers that have good dates. They're interspersed by volcanic tephra. And so we have dates on stuff that goes all the way back from a little before three million, all the way up to about a million with a sweet spot between three and two million years that has just a whole bunch of stacks of sediments. And at Omo, you can see at about 2.7, the start of this robust morphology, and by about 2.3 million years, the distribution of tooth sizes is bimodal, right? So you can see this, this, this speciation happening. And like I said, that's about as good as it gets. We have good evidence that there are two different species, robust Australopithecus and Homo habilis. And this is a reconstruction by Jay Maternus uh, that sort of depicts a little bit of a violent altercation between Homo habilis and Australopithecus boisei, but it's probably unlikely that there was an animosity between these two because they coexisted for a good million years or so, right? So we're not talking about extermination or anything like that, but we do have coexistence. A lot of people have speculated about why that is, and certainly early Homo, Homo habilis, uses tools and is associated with meat-eating a lot, right? You can't really not associate Boisei with tools, but a lot of people have speculated that there's something dietary about it. It has really big molars and premolars and big jaw muscles, and it stands to reason that there might be something uh, dietary that is driving this divergence. Okay, so what this means, sort of to sum it up, is that in order to detect species in the fossil record, you need a little bit more information than uh, just a bunch of different fossils from different places. You have to, because you can have uh, change in a lineage over time, you have to have control of the time, right? If you find something from late and something from early, then that change might just be evolutionary, right? And the same goes for space. If things are uh, spaced out quite a bit, um, you can have big variation, clinal variation, that could also limit your ability to do this, right? So finding stuff at the same time in the same place is important. So, um, this is actually something to be thinking about. We talked about the growler bear before. Uh, when we're thinking about species and we're thinking about the way speciations might occur, a lot of geneticists suggest that the speciation between polar bears and grizzly bears started happening about two million years ago, right? And it's continuing to happen, right? Would you call polar bears and grizzly bears species now? Most people would, right, actually. Most people would call those two different species. I don't mean to bring it up and say everybody's wrong about that. Nobody's wrong about that. They don't hybridize that readily, so it's really an uncommon thing. Um, but they do hybridize, and this uh, divergence has been taking place over a really long time. And if you think about that, what that means is that there must have been a time when the polar bears, or when the, the almost polar bears in the northern part of the grizzly range looked a little bit different than the grizzly bears at the bottom end of the range, right, before the actual divergence, if there ever was one. The bottom line is clinal variation is important. So how do we recognize species in the fossil record? Okay, so in order to kind of uh, give you a, an intro to some of the technical stuff that we do for trying to identify this stuff or trying to come up with evolutionary pattern, we're gonna do a little bit more history. Because uh, it turns out that the way that we organize stuff evolutionarily uh, dates back well before the time of Darwin. It's stuff that Linnaeus noticed, right? Now, uh, if you look at uh, the Systema Naturae, the big book of taxonomy that Linnaeus put together, uh, what you'll find is that in the original version, uh, he puts whales where? In the fish, right? And why does he put them in the fish? Is he stupid? 
because they've got fins and they swim around in the water and they look like fish, right? Because they look like fish on the outside. But if you look on the inside, they don't really look like fish. And Linnaeus moves whales to mammals in 1758. That's a whale pelvis, right? Whales have pelvises, they have little vestigial femurs and things like that. They've got a lot of indications that uh, they're mammals, right? In fact, you can look at them in greater detail and you can find um, a lot of different morphological overlap with mammals, right? Because they are mammals, right? And Linnaeus noticed that and he moved whales uh, into mammals in 1758. Now, Inadvertently, what Linnaeus had done is distinguish between homology and analogy, right? In evolutionary biology, those features that are similar as a result of convergent evolution are called analogies. Those features that are similar because they're shared from a common ancestor are called homologies. And Linnaeus recognized that homologies are good for grouping stuff, but analogies are not good for grouping stuff, right? So when you're putting together your taxonomy, you should look for those features that are deep similarities and not those features that are superficial similarities. And of course, when Linnaeus shook down the whole record, it ends up looking like a tree, right? When Linnaeus sort of stacked up his taxonomy, the nested hierarchy that it formed really looks a lot like an evolutionary tree. Now, if you look at evolution or if you look at an evolutionary tree on a large scale, what you'll find is that overwhelmingly homology is more common uh, than convergent evolution, right? In fact, if you think about it, like we have a lot more similarities uh, with a bat than we do with, or than bats do with birds, right? And that's because we share a whole bunch of features as a result of being mammals. And it turns out that those features that we share with bats overwhelm the features that look like we share with birds because of this convergent evolution. And what that means is that you can actually sort things out that way, right? You can compare trees and look and see which branches are based on a, a signal that is due to conversion evolution or which ones are due to homology. So what you would do is compare two trees and then the changes that were explained via homology or look for the things there where the shape similarities are mostly explained from homology, that should be the most likely tree, right? Cladistics is the method for comparing trees and looking for the ones that have the best explanation via homology. That's all it is. It's looking for the most simply explained tree using homology. And there's been a lot of applications to this in paleontology, including, for better or for worse, human paleontology. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can use cladistics or that you can look for species and then apply them to cladistics or even apply cladistics beforehand. And a lot of people that are familiar with the technique would suggest that actually what you do is you do the analysis and then you look for the clusters and that's how you recognize species in the fossil record, right? That's one of the methods that you might use if you're doing that. And cladistics has revolutionized the way that we look at the dinosaur fossil record. And part of it, you know, it's actually revolutionized a lot of different aspects of evolutionary biology. It's an incredibly powerful method, especially when you start to apply it to genetics. Um, and when you apply it to uh, dinosaurs, you get things like dinosaurs are for sure um, birds or birds are for sure dinosaurs, right? That's the kind of picture that emerged as a result of cladistics. It used to be debatable, now there's nobody who debates that, right? And so it's been this incredibly powerful method when it comes to sorting out sort of these big issues in evolutionary biology. But there's a lot of assumptions that you use when you are doing a cladistic analysis. A lot of them are pretty easy. We've gone over like one and two we're just gonna give as given. Um, number three is that homology is more common than convergent evolution, which we just sort of explained, and it is. Um, but there's another one when it comes to trying to sort out patterns of different species. Now, if you're looking for patterns of lineage divergence, then you're assuming when you put the different taxa into that analysis that they are different species, right? And it turns out that while that's actually a pretty easy assumption to make for dinosaurs that are separated by hundreds of thousands of years for each one of the different discoveries, um, it's not so easy to make that same assumption for humans, right? When you're looking at the human fossil record, you don't know where gene flow barriers are. Um, it turns out to be much more difficult. In fact, I could take all you guys in the room and score you. I could score your cranium morphologically. I could run a cladistic analysis of you guys and you'd all be on different branches, right? But that wouldn't be real because you're all one species and you could all potentially interbreed. Well, males could interbreed with females, females with males, and 
guess technology has opened up a couple of other new doors. There's, a, <laughs> yeah, there's another uh, way that we can detect species in the fossil record, though, fortunately, and that's the one that I already told you. It's kind of called a boring name. It's called a historical species concept, where you're actually using time and space to kind of locate groups, and you know, it's a more uh, organic way of doing it, and it's really all we have to deal with in the human fossil record, because we really don't know where those boundaries are. Now, I should throw that out with a bit of a caveat. As we're starting to be able to analyze more and more human ancestors with DNA, um, we're actually able to see a couple of different things that aren't as visible when you're looking at just the bones. Um, in any case, uh, what we have with all that included is a pretty good idea that Neanderthals and modern humans are not the same species. We have this divergence that occurred around two and a half million years, and that's kind of what we've got in terms of the really good evidence for there being different species. And if you look in this graph, you're gonna see a couple more times, actually a lot more times in the lecture, um, represents the human diaspora. And on the right is Africa and Eurasia, or excuse me, is Eurasia, and on the left is Africa. And so the type specimen for Homo erectus is kind of way out in the boondocks of this overall pattern of human evolution. And that means that it's actually kind of hard to get it to map on to this sort of main line of human evolution that's happening in Africa, right? It's hard to get that species to make sense with that whole lineage of stuff. Now, Hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense as we go on. Um, this is what the record looks like, and the lines are long if the dates are bad, right? They're shorter if the dates are good, and this is an array of fossils that we have of Homo erectus. There's actually quite a few sites, so the picture is, you know, starting to come up off the background. It's not in any way a clear picture, but it is starting to emerge. You can see there's a lot of space in between there, though, so there's a little bit of a, you know, there's, 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 a, lot of, there's a lot of room to find more fossils, right? So, to make this talk kind of make sense, I'm gonna do my best to break it down into kind of handleable zones, right? So let's uh, break this down a little bit. When you think about Homo erectus, it's actually easy to think about early Homo erectus and then sort of middle Homo erectus and then later Homo erectus. And if you break it apart like that, you can kind of think of different locations. You can think of Africa early on, Eurasia early on, and you can think of uh, in that sort of middle zone, the same things, Africa and Eurasia, and I've Eurasia sort of broken apart into west and east. Does that make sense? Well, if it does or if it doesn't, we will still go on. So before Homo erectus, there's Homo habilis. We already started to talk a little bit about Homo habilis. You see the first good Homo habilis fossils, things that are really distinctive, about 2.3 or so million years. At Homo, like I said, you can start to see that divergence, and 2.3 is when you start to see uh, really good fossils that are definitively homo. Bed wanted at Olduvai Gorge is actually about 1.8 million years, so it's significantly after the earliest uh, genus homo fossils. Um, there are more fossils that are getting found at Olduvai Gorge. Some of the most uh, prominent fossils of Homo habilis come from the Kubi 4 area around Lake Turkana. We've got ER 1813 and ER 1470. Um, to give you a little bit of a sense about the way that species literature works in paleoanthropology, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not Homo habilis from Cubifora is one species or two species. A number of people would put the bigger one, AR 1470, into Homo rudolfensis and the smaller into Homo habilis. Um, a lot of people think that size differences are not the best ones to use for species differences because of sexual dimorphism. Males can be bigger than females, right? And so you might have some problems there. Now, um, but you can see, I mean, is it one species? Is it two species? One's big, one's little. I don't know. Different people have said different things, and they are published, right? Okay, so let's move into early Homo erectus. Um, at the same site, at Kubifora, actually a couple hundred thousand years later, or maybe about 150,000 years later, you start to see stuff that is called Homo erectus. It has significantly larger cranial capacities, um, or not significantly, either 3083 is pretty much the same as the, uh, a little bit bigger than 1470, and 3733 is mm, significantly. I mean, these are on the low side of Homo erectus, and a lot of people would call this a sort of more primitive than classic Homo erectus. I'd sort of agree, although I would call it Homo erectus. Um, there's more specimens that have been found from Kubi 4, so this is actually a pretty, uh, a pretty rich area. And another sort of important fossil for our discussion that comes from Kubi 4 is this mandible, ER 992. It's the type specimen for species Homo ergaster, right? And a lot of people would call these early Homo erectus fossils Homo ergaster. Um, there's an Ereicotomy kid, uh, about 1.5 million years old, so a really good skeleton, very complete, and it's also from around the Lake Turkana area. 
If you move out of Africa at this time, you've also got some pretty early, uh, I don't know what you call them, I guess Homo erectus is the right thing. I sort of vacillate on whether to call these guys Homo erectus. They look a lot like the Homo habilis stuff that you find from, um, from Kubifora and a little bit like the Nereicotomy kit, as we'll see in a second. But Demonisi is a really amazing site. Um, there's four published crania. There's five of them that they have now. Um, they've got a lot of postcranial fossils and a few tools, and it's 1.8 million years old outside of Africa in Georgia uh, in the Caucasus. Okay, so if we move all the way to the eastern part of Eurasia, there are some claims of pretty early dates. Uh, there's been a date of 1.8 million years on some fossils from Indonesia, actually a fossil, uh, the Mojo Kirto child, although um, it's sort of a questionable dating. A lot of people think that it might be a little bit on the early side. Uh, the Sangaran Dome, which is actually a pretty big area with a whole bunch of fossils, has a very well-dated volcanic sequence, and about 1.5 is when you see the first pretty sure uh, human fossils in that sequence. So by about 1.5, there's Homo erectus all the way across into uh, Indonesia and Southeast Asia. If we look at about a million years, there's a lot of Homo erectus in Africa. Um, OH9, Olduvai Gorge, has Homo erectus, not from bed one, but from higher in the sequence. Uh, the Daka cranium, which we'll be talking a lot about later on tonight, uh, Buya. Um, there's a number of different things at about a million years, and for a lot of reasons, it's kind of a sweet spot, right? It's kind of right in the middle of Homo erectus range, and it's right in the sort of epicenter of human evolution in the sort of northeastern part of Africa. If we move into central, or to actually it's sort of the western part of Eurasia, there's not a lot of stuff really early on at about a million years. There's plenty of tools, so we know that there's hominids there, but there's no real good Homo erectus crania at a million years. Uh, in Europe. Now, there is a great site. Um, there's actually numerous different localities inside this area called Atapuerca. And one of the sites goes down to about a million years, and there have been several specimens that have been pulled from there. Um, they've been called Homo antecessor, although it's really hard to put them into any group because the main specimen is a juvenile, right? Um, if we move farther to the east, there's actually a lot of fossils that are about a million years. Uh, from the eastern part of Eurasia, some from China, that's not really a great date on Gondwongling. Uh, Trinil, which is of course the type specimen for Homo erectus, is probably about a million years. The Sangaran specimens are about a million, a little bit more. Um, and there's numerous Sangaran specimens now, a lot of these guys. So this is actually pretty well known. If we move a little bit later in time, it's interesting because it seems like Homo erectus persists in kind of the same way in the eastern part of Eurasia longer than it does in other places. So um, there's lots of different fossils from this time frame in the eastern part of Eurasia in Indonesia and in China, and they all kind of have that same Homo erectus look to them. Some fossils from Indonesia have been dated to pretty recently. Some of these have been dated to about 35,000 years, but again, that date has been really questioned. A lot of people put the Ngandong fossils at about 500,000 years. They question that 35,000 year date. At the same time, if we go to Africa, you start seeing way more advanced forms, right? So at 500,000, 600,000 years, you see Homo erectus in the eastern part of Eurasia, and in Africa, you're starting to see bigger cranial capacities, differences in behavior, like more complex tools, and um, a lot of good evidence that something's happening there. In Landsfontein in South Africa, Bodo in Ethiopia, cranial capacity of about 1,300 cc's, and probably at least 20% of you have cranial capacities that are below that in this room right now. So we're kind of getting into the range of modern humans. Maybe, maybe not 20%, maybe 10%. <laughs> or maybe, maybe this is a good room full of brainy people, right? Maybe we've got uh, way fewer than the normal the normal average. Okay, so in Europe during this time, um, it's a little bit more ambiguous. If you go a little bit later, um, the dates on uh, Soprano have actually recently changed. It used to be that people thought it was kind of old, and now the, the, the same people who published the original dates have come back and said it's more like about 400,000 years. It's not exactly a Neanderthal. A lot of these sort of early things from Europe are pre-Neanderthals. It's not a Homo erectus, right? Um, Cima de los Huesos, this is another site in, or from that Atapuerca region, and these have a lot of features that are starting to look like Neanderthals. If we go to the eastern part of Eurasia, even as late as about 200,000 years, you still see stuff that looks a lot like Homo erectus, with the same cranial capacity and everything like that. So a picture is kind of emerging of what's happening with Homo erectus. Early on, 
you have stuff that is, you know, more primitive, right, in both Africa and Eurasia. At about a million years, you've got stuff that's roughly similar, about 1,000 cc cranial capacity all across the old world. And if you move a little bit later, you're starting to see more advanced forms and more advanced tools in Africa, and you are seeing the same old Homo erectus hanging on in the eastern part of Eurasia. Okay, so a couple of different evolutionary hypotheses that have been posed about Homo erectus, they're kind of cladistic, right? When cladistics sort of took over mainstream paleontology, one of the things that happened is that uh, paleoanthropology started to sort of try to apply the logic of it. And a lot of people started to say, well, and this is before a whole bunch of these Homo erectus fossils that I showed you had been found, a lot of people started to say, well, these early Kubifora ones, they don't look like the stuff from the eastern part of Eurasia. And it's true that they don't, right? But you started to have people say there's a different species in Africa, and think about this distinction between Africa and Eurasia. It turns out that most of those comparisons were not done comparing things from the same time. So it's probably a bit of a moot point. We found stuff that's now able to address this. One of the weird things that that did, though, is it means that, so suppose that you call the African stuff Homo ergaster and the Eurasian stuff Homo erectus. It means that Homo erectus isn't an ancestor of Homo sapiens, right? And so it's sort of this weird logic. I mean, I suppose that I'm turning it into a bit of a, of a straw man here, but it's true that there wasn't a good, uh, a good ancestor for Homo sapiens and Homo erectus, and we had all these different fossils that look kind of halfway there. In any case, Homo erectus is characterized by a set of features that are pretty simple. It's got a, usually a keel down the midline, either it extends onto the frontal or along the sagittal, uh, the sagittal suture, pretty robust brow ridges. It's got a long and low cranium, although that's just sort of an aspect of its uh, size overall. It's got a lower cranial capacity. It's got thick vault bones, and that's actually kind of an interesting one, because the stuff that comes before doesn't really have that thick of vault bones, and of course we, except in some populations, don't have that thick of vault bones. Um, and so a lot of people have speculated about why that might be, because it sort of seems adaptive, right? It seems like it's an adaptation. And some have even speculated this because stone tools started to happen and people were bashing each other over the head. And, you know, I, I don't know, it's a little bit far-fetched. Nobody's ever been able to prove that one. But they do have thicker cranial capacities. Now, or excuse me, thicker vault bones. The cranial capacity is about 1,000 cc's, give or take a little bit. So there's the docker cranium coming out. There it is. Uh, my finger pointing to the little piece of the cranium there in the soil. And when we found that, uh, it looked like a Homo erectus, right? We found it, it came out of the ground, it looks like an Asian Homo erectus. In fact, when we did these sort of base measurements, not anything sort of evolutionary or cladistic, a lot of the measurements even overlapped with the stuff that we found um, in Asia. So uh, being a biologist, we were well versed in cladistics, and so we understood that the way that this was going to be addressed was using cladistics, right? Somebody's going to take this and try to, to analyze it using cladistics. And so we decided that that was something that we should address. Now, we know full well that there's problems with cladistics, right? That you have to have different species to begin with, or the tree that it spits out isn't showing a tree of lineages at all. It's just showing a cluster of the way things are sort of more or less related to each other. Um, so. The way that we tried to address that is to group it off in as many different ways as we can. So if I take each individual in this room, it's obviously going to be a silly analysis, right? But it might make more sense if we take the Homo erectus fossils from, say, Africa at a million years versus Eurasia at a million years and try to make these time-space groupings. Or maybe we should just like group the stuff from the same sites together and the stuff that's individual and isolated, we'll analyze that separately. There's no good way to do it, but we tried to do it in all different ways. Another thing that you run into when you're starting to do these kinds of analyses on a very closely related species is that some of the characters might not be meaningful, right? When you're looking at a bat and a dog and you're going one has wings and one has legs, One's an adaptation, and there's really not that much of a question about the evolutionary origins or the reason why those features would uh, make those two things separate. If I was able to look at x-rays of each one of your crania, 
I could detect lots of differences. Each one of you has individual differences in your cranium, and it's obvious. Each one of you has individual differences on your outside, and so it starts to become this kind of game of splitting hairs, which features are the ones that are meaningful at a species level, and which ones are just sort of the variation that you'd expect in a population, right? And to kind of show you what I mean by that, here's two Homo sapiens crania uh, from the same pre-contact population, and lo and behold, they're quite different, right? I mean, that's not really that much of a surprise, but the types of features that you see distinguishing these are really not all that different from the kind of features that are used typically in Homo erectus analysis. Cranial capacity is one, uh, but things like cranial vault shape, like how long and low is it, and you just measure those things and then compare the metrics of those, and that's something you'd have variation for in, the, in this room. Uh, whether or not they're sutural keeling, and I don't know if this light will do it, but I've got a nice Homo erectus uh, frontal keel, so you know, I guess I, I guess I qualify for that one, right? Um, interorbital breadth, and I know you've seen people with skinny space between their eyes and people with thick space between their eyes, right? And so this feature is something that is used in Homo erectus phylogeny, right? Um, vault thickness, well. We do have variation in our vault thickness. Now, maybe the kinds of things that are used in Homo erectus are a little bit more thick. I don't know. It turns out, though, that the features that are used for Homo erectus cladistics are not all that different from just the typical kind of variation that you would find in a population, right? It's not like there's any new special feature that's evolved in Homo erectus. They get bigger brains, but that's kind of what looks to be the trajectory more than anything else, right? Okay. So the way that we did the analysis is like lots of different ways. One of the ways we did it is we broke it down into these different time-space clusters, kind of like the ones that I showed you. And when you do that, you don't get any kind of distinction between Africa and Eurasia, right? In fact, it's kind of all over the place. The different colors indicate Africa versus Eurasia. And no matter how we did it, if we did it based on sites or if we did it based on individual crania, you'd get this split. Now, places like individual sites would actually cluster together, right? But you couldn't get this large scale pattern between Africa and Eurasia. So basically, you know, none of those cladistic ideas were supported. And for that reason, we end up calling the whole group Homo erectus, or at least that's the logic. Now, um, I don't know, anybody, any professors out there teach human evolution? I know, I know you do, Pat. Um, is it easier to teach it that way or is it not? Does it make more sense? So think about that. So if you're calling all of Homo erectus one species, one of the things that we know for sure is that those little groups that I just showed you have way more variation than any groups of Homo sapiens, right? So there probably were some little pockets that were reproductively isolated. Um, but you don't see this large-scale pattern between Africa and Eurasia, so should we just name each different site a different species? And that ends up being really, really confusing because then you've just completely sacrificed the whole integrity of what a species is just for that, right? So um, it ends up being kind of, kind, kind of tricky, and so we call the whole thing Homo erectus, right? And it turns out that cladistics isn't the only way that you would analyze this and come up with the same thing. In fact, um, cladistics is only arguably even worthwhile to apply to most paleoanthropological stuff. A lot of people use multivariate morphological analysis, and the same story uh, emerges from that, where you don't have this patterning of Asia versus Africa, Homo erectus. Okay, so um, basically the way that I think of Homo erectus is kind of starting you know, about one point, I don't know, five to seven million years ago. It's hard for me to know what to call Demonisi, but I do end up calling all that early stuff, including the first things that spilled out into Eurasia, Homo erectus, recognizing that it's different and more primitive than the stuff that comes about a million years. A million years is classic Homo erectus, and then it hangs out in the eastern part of Eurasia longer than it hangs out in Africa. That's a little bit cluttered, isn't it? But uh, that's a little bit better. Um, so I, there's a lot of stuff that is going to come later that I don't include in Homo erectus, like Bodo and a number of things. This graphic is a little bit old, so Homo erectus or Gaster is what this came out with the original 2003 publication. Um, but that's a good general um, idea. I'd be more inclined with the new dates of Ngandong to pull those a little bit closer into the circle, but um, there you have it. Uh, I'm not the only one who's said things like this, right? And there's a whole genre of paleoanthropologists 
who are not really uh, overly convinced by cladistics, right? And so you'll see a lot of people that would suggest that this is kind of the pattern, that Homo erectus does persist a little bit longer in Eurasia, okay? Okay, so now let's talk about stuff that's a little bit less theoretical. We can talk a little bit about tools, because there's kind of an interesting picture, kind of an interesting story to tell with the Ashelaean. Um, a lot of times, if you learn it the first time you hear Homo erectus is associated with the Ashelaean, but um, there is a little bit more to it than that. Um, the first thing to do is point out a sort of distinction, right? Ashelaean technology. Ashelaean is actually named after this place called saint Achoul in France, but fortuitously, um, it is the same word as axe, and um, a uh, the Ashelaean is characterized by these tools called hand axes, which are symmetrical, kind of teardropped, ovate-shaped uh, bifaces that are flaked usually around most of the edges. Sometimes they have a little bit of cortex on a part of them. Oldowan tools are cores that have been flaked, right? That have been bi sometimes bifacially flaked, sometimes not even bifacially flaked, and are simple. And you'd think the distinction is pretty easy, but what you find is that there's early Ashelaean, and then there's the classic Ashelaean, right? And the early Ashelaean tends to look more primitive, right? And so what we end up with at the end of the day is this kind of more difficult to conceive of thing. There's a lot of papers these days that are looking for the earliest Ashelaean and say, we found the earliest Ashelaean at 1.7 million years. And they say, and we found one symmetrical tool, right? We found one symmetrical tool that indicates that we have the Ashelaean. And some of the tools are not all that symmetrical. And so it's almost easier to think about this as being like, Ashelaean and non-Ashelaean, right? I know, that's really confusing. Let's look at a couple of different Ashelaean tools. Here's some classic, million-year-old DACA, actually, uh, Ashelaean tools. And you can see there's a lot of these sort of ovate shapes. Um, the reason why those big tools are used rather than the small flakes is actually kind of interesting, right? You'd think, why not just knock off those little flakes? And it turns out that the flakes are pretty sharp, but if you do any actualistic butchery experiments, you'll realize right away why those large cutting tools are more useful than the small ones. It ends up being way easier to cut through, uh, to butcher a carcass that way. Another thing that you can tell by looking at some of these things in the Ashelaean is that it does seem like there was a preferential right-handedness starting up with at least some of Homo erectus. Now, um, you'll see that the, the initial analysis by Toth does have some people that have uh, detracted from it, but most people um, agree that the indication of handedness that results when you look at the number of right-handed flakes from left-handed flakes is sort of meaningful, right? So it looks like something's happening in Homo erectus brains where they're starting to be lateralized in their brains, probably for dexterity, right? They're definitely eating a lot of meat, and in a lot of places, you find quarries, right? In the Ashelaean, uh, the primary raw material sources are river cobbles, and quarries where they'll knock off big flakes out of an outcrop of a basaltic rock and then uh, make a hand axe on that flake. And they're never more than about five kilometers away from the sites where they're produced in the Ashelaean. They're not engaging in long distance travel, at least as what is indicated thus far. Never know what we're gonna find tomorrow, but thus far, they're staying pretty close to the place where they get the rocks from. At about a million years, you see good Ashelaean in Africa, right? Really classic Ashelaean. One of the th reasons why we can say that this is truly Ashelaean is not just because you find one Ashelaean hand axe. And it turns out that if you find, say, a hundred different hand axe, or a hundred different tools, and one of them looks like a hand axe, it might be sort of a more random, uh, random thing than that's actually what the people were making there, right? It's easy to end up with a lot of variation in shape and one of them looking like a hand axe if you have a whole big assemblage. And a lot of times, assemblages are cherry-picked. Uh, but a place like Orgosile, what they've done is looked for percentages and everybody agrees that Orgosile is actually in sight. Um, and the reason is because there's such a high percentage of these classic bifacially flaked um, symmetrical tools. Now, if you think about it that way, you don't see the Ashelaean outside of Africa at a million years, right? You don't see it outside there. There might be a few tools that people have said, this looks like a hand axe, but there is no big Ashelaean industry happening outside of Africa. And there's plenty of it happening inside of Africa. This is what you see at a million years in Grandolina in Spain. Uh, I don't think that's a hand axe, and most of the stuff looks like that, right? Here's some hand axes, right? 
but these are the very best of hundreds of tools that they pulled out of there, right? So it's not Ashelaian. Um, another one, Ubadiah. These are the very best. Some people have claimed that you've got Ashelaian at Ubadiah, but there's a whole bunch of tools, and these are the only three that look like that, right? Um, if you go to about a half million years, you find Ashelaian all over Western Eurasia and Africa and stuff that starts to look a little Ashelaian in the eastern part of Eurasia. But um, importantly, uh, you don't find any of these classic Ashelaian assemblages in a lot of places where all the raw materials are present where Homo erectus is not making Ashelaian tools in the eastern part of Eurasia. There's a good classic Ashelaian hand axe about 400,000 years ago in France, and that's what they would have looked like. Um, from the SEMA, there's also one hand axe, but that's more to show you guys what they look like. Um, here's some stuff that you can find in the eastern part of Eurasia from the Bose Basin in China, and it does make you kind of wonder um, if there is Ashelaian, but this was actually a site where there's a lot of stone tools, once again, and this is stuff that has been, I guess, cherry-picked is the right word for it. Now, the date of less than 0.8 million years is actually, it's probably a lot less than 0.8 million years. The reason it's less than 0.8 million years is because it's all normal, uh, normal polarity, right? So it's not necessarily something that's got a real, real good early date. Um, people have published it as being Ashleyan-like. Um, however, uh, the good classic Ashleyan assemblages where you find all these stacks of tools are from Africa, right? So was Homo erectus using fire? Uh, it turns out that finding fire in the fossil record is not all that easy to do. Uh, the first possible evidences for fire are layers that have carbon in them, right? Layers that have, that have ashes or, or uh, that have charcoal. And, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can get charcoal. And so th places like Chokutian or some of these other places that have been suggested to have really good early evidence for fire, Chesuanja, um, are are kind of debatable. They might be lightning strikes, they might be you know, forest fires or brush fires or things like that. And about the first place where you get good consensus on everybody agrees that this is probably fire is from this place called Gesher Benat Yaakov in Israel. And the reason why is because there's actually a huge Ashleyan assemblage, lots and lots of hand axes. And uh, so we know that people were there and we know that they're making their hand axes there. We also see that there's these localized pits where there's fire and charcoal and there's a bunch of edible plants charred up inside those pits. And so a lot of people think that this is about the earliest good evidence for fire. Um, so Homo erectus is probably flirting with fire a little bit and at least by 700,000 years was using it. Um, there's spears at about 400,000 years. Now, you know that chimps will make little spears and poke bush babies to try to get them. So like the idea that nobody ever made a wooden tool until 400,000 years ago is kind of preposterous. But uh, you do find uh, wooden tools at 400,000 years. Um, it's probably because they don't preserve that long. It turns out that rocks preserve really well. And you know, every, you know, I have one uh, humerus and I don't use stone tools, but I probably made a good 150 stone tools in my life, right? And those are all gonna stay way after my humerus vaporizes, right? Okay, so that's Homo erectus. Now let's look at Dhaka. It turns out that Dhaka is actually a really good place to look at Homo erectus. It's kind of right in the right spot. It's a million years, kind of right when the Ashelaian is about to spill out into the rest of the old world. It's right in the middle of that time range. So let's see what people are doing in the Dhaka. First of all, let's see what it is. It's in the Rift Valley, and you can go to sort of the top end of the Rift Valley here. It's really close to a lot of other major sites really close to the middle of Awash and Hadar. Uh, it's also close to Dikika, Mele Waranso. Uh, a bunch of major hominid sites are located really close to Bori, where the Daka cranium is from. And let's zoom in on that place just a little bit here. Uh, the Bori, it's called a peninsula, although if you were out there, it wouldn't look like a mountain, and it wouldn't look like a peninsula. It's just a river that kind of twists around, and there's a lake on one side of it. But that little jut of land there, is Bori. And at Bori, there's actually a number of different stratigraphic horizons. You've got the Herto member and the Daka member and the Hata member, and at each one of those different horizons, there are hominid fossils. The Hata member has the earliest cut marked bones at about two and a half million years. 160,000 years, we've got the earliest Homo sapiens, and actually some of the latest Ashelaian also. At a million years, there's Homo erectus and lots of stone tools. Um, 
One of the great things about this site, and it makes it unique in a lot of ways, is that it's part of a broadly exposed stratigraphic layer. And in that stratigraphic layer, there's a whole bunch of different archaeology localities and also a lot of different animals. And so we can put together kind of a complete picture of what this world would have been like. The date on it is also really good, right? Because the, there's a nice marker horizon that underlies the whole unit at about, hundred, about oh, let's see, a million point, you know, four, excuse me, 1.004. Um, and then there's another horizon higher up that has pumices at 998,000. So it looks like most of the unit is about a million years, right? Um, the pumices only occur in one of the sections, but they're above a different layer that outcrops in a whole bunch of different areas. So we've got a relatively good control of about a million years on this thing. And there's a whole bunch of animal fossils. There is a pig cranium coming out, and it turns out that um, there's a lot of different pigs. And I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures of different animals, the ones that are uh, the ones that are in photographs um, are ones that still exist. The ones that are drawings are ones that are extinct. And it's kind of interesting because at a million years in Africa, about 50-50, about half of them are extinct and half of them still live. It's kind of an interesting time. Um, so Colpacurus magus, Colpacurus oldoviensis, Matridiacurus compactus. There's four different species of pigs that exist in the DACA member. Um, also, Fakakirs, which are modern warthogs, and most of the species that exist are considerably larger than modern warthogs. That's kind of fun to look at. They would have been dangerous pigs, right? Um, there's hippos, hyenas. The hyena's pretty much the same as crocuda crocuda. Lions, there's panthers, or, or that's a leopard, sorry, panthera. Uh, there's elephants, but it's elephus genus, and elephus is the genus of the Asian elephant, so it's actually... Uh, not Loxodonta that we find there. A um, couple of different species of horses. There's Equus, which is the same genus as modern zebras. It probably didn't look the same as zebras or donkeys, but um, same genus. And then there's also Eurgnathohippus, which is a hipparium. Um, there's giraffes. There are Sevathirs. Sevathirs are a giraffe relative that has moose-like antlers. They're actually ossicones. They're not antlers. They're covered with skin. So the same thing as a, as a giraffe's ossicone. Um, there's one rodent. It was actually pretty light on the rodents, this site. A couple of different species of monkeys, including a new species of Circopithecus monkey, Circopithecoides actually, and Theropithecus. Um, there are a number of different bovids, and bovids are, are antelopes. Bovids are all cow relatives, and it turns out that uh, there's always going to be more of these kinds of animals than there are carnivores and primates because they're the producers, right? They're the ones that are eating plants, and so you find far more uh, herbivore fossils than you find carnivore fossils. And bovids are also really important because they tend to be really niche-specific, right? They tend to focus on a particular ecology or type of food, and it allows you to say stuff about the environment, right? It allows you to put together the kind of place that it was. Some are better than others. So in the DACA member, we've got Conicates, which is a wildebeest, Megalotragus, which is a wildebeest relative. They're actually really similar except the horns. Uh, Nididarchus, another wildebeest relative, Pneumaticapra. There's a whole bunch of these alcelophanes, Damaliscus. And you can see the kind of environment that they typically live in. They live in these sort of dry, open environments. They have really long teeth, much longer than a cow for the size that they are. And they wear their teeth down a lot because they chew on these dry grasses. Uh, Parmularius, another one of these alcelophenes. Um, there's also caprons, which is kind of weird because, well, you do have capra ibex up in the Ethiopian highlands at this time, but it's more of a, a Eurasian form, so people wonder about the climate for that. Oryx, which is another sort of dry, open country type of animal, Hippotragus, similarly. Um, there's a couple of different buffaloes, right? Pelorovus. There's two different species of Pelorovus, which is this giant horned buffalo. Um, and then there's also just your modern water buffalo. So there's a lot of these different bovids. Now, the water buffaloes and the cobus are actually not good environmental indicators because they end up liking water. So they spend a lot of time down by water. And um, if there's one thing that you know when you find fossils, you know that there was water there because all fossils, well, not every single one of them. There are cases where you have fossils that are preserved in non-aqueous environments, but um, for the most part, fossils are formed where you have water uh, covering them with sediment, right? And so it's not really uncommon to find water-loving animals 
in fossil assemblages. Both species of cobus are that kind of thing. Um, gazelles are a better indicator of this sort of dry open country because they only rarely come to the water. Tragelophus, um, there's also a couple of fish fossils, but finding a catfish fossil is very, very unmeaningful. There's zillions of catfish fossils. So um, with all those fossils, we can actually put together a pretty good diorama of what it would have looked like in DACA member times. We would have been able to see, uh, we can see exactly what the kind of environment was, and we can actually do a little bit more. We, I mean, obviously there's a, a water source there for reasons that I just described, but we can also say that uh, the stuff adjacent to the water was probably this sort of drier grassland area. So it wasn't a big closed environment. As far as the hominids go, there's more than just the cranium. There's a cranium, there's three femurs, there's a tibia, and a couple of cranial fragments, an edentulous mandible that looks great, but it's actually not that great, um, a talus that's also a little bit beat up. Um, now, from the femurs, I mean, there's a few things that we could, were able to say. First of all, you know, a lot of the features that you see in Homo erectus femurs, well, <laughs> should take a step back from that one. They look a lot like Homo erectus femurs, but there's a couple of things that make us wonder if the features that have been really solidly applied to Homo erectus might not be a little bit looser than has been stated. But um, probably more interestingly, um, we know that Homo erectus was squatting. I guess that's not really that much of, a, uh, of, a, of an amazing discovery or anything like that, but it's actually something crisp and solid that we can say. Um, the femoral antiversion that we see in Homo erectus from Daca and a couple of other uh, Homo erectus specimens is exactly the same kind of thing that you get in squatting modern populations. So that's probably the way that some Daca member Homo erectus was making their tools. And, Here's what the tools from the DACA member look like. They're typical Ashelaean, but they're not all hand axes. You find retouched denticulates, scrapers, things like that all through the assemblage. A number of disc cores, discoids, cleavers, uh, things like that. And I threw out these names, like the types have some kind of functional meaning. Nobody knows what these things are being used for. I mean, we have some idea that they're gonna be used for skinning animals and things like that, but any of the types, any of the, sta the statements like cleaver or hand axe, those are typological terms that are applied without any kind of understanding of the way that they're used. So we can actually put together a pretty good picture of what the DACA member was like um, now, let's see, I actually ended quite a bit early, so we're gonna be able to have a nice round of questions here. I spit it out real, real fast. Um, if you guys are curious about this, one of the things that I did for the DACA member was that I took pictures of every single one of the fossils, and then I put all the pictures online. So, I mean, you don't have to go and buy the book, although you can go buy the book on Amazon for cheaper than the cover price these days. Uh, but you can go for free to this website and see all the different fossils and all the different views. Now, one of the reasons why that's kind of an interesting thing to do is you'll see that I like pick the very best fossils to show you guys, right? Most of the fossils that we collect are little scraps of tooth and you know lots of uh, things that are really not all that amazing to look at. But, they do end up being really meaningful when you tabulate the percentages of different animals and stuff. And so if you're curious about what's there, uh, please do have a look. And uh, if you feel like studying them, drop a dime and go to Ethiopia and check them out. I mean, that's one of the reasons why they're, they're there. And I, I always make that plug a little bit because it's actually easier than you might think, right? If you call Fauna Travel in Washington, DC, you can get a ticket to Ethiopia for about, I don't know, uh, 1,600 bucks, I know it's not pocket change, but once you get there, the food's pretty cheap, right? And you can stay in a, stay in a medium range hotel and you can go and study in the museum and you'll be doing a great service to the country and paying Ethiopian airlines and everything like that. So um, it's not that far away and you can do it. Um, all the fossils, of course, do stay in Ethiopia and so it's not really that much of a joke. One of the reasons why I made that is because one of the things that I found when I was doing the study is that it was really, really difficult to know what was in museums in different places. So imagine that I'm putting together a grant and I'm trying to know whether or not it's gonna be worthwhile to make a stop in Arusha to see if there's you know, a particular pig. And if the catalog says that it's got Colpicurus magus and I go there and it's got a Colpicurus magus vertebrae and I don't have any vertebrae in my collection, right? I just messed up and I just wasted money. So anyway, if you wanna see what's in the DACA member collection, you can, you can see every single one. Okay, so here's where the thing starts to happen. Now, one of the things that's really important to point out is that 
you know, there's only one person that can get up and talk about it at a time. I've seen a couple of different places where you have, you know, multiple different individuals, but there's always one person talking at any one time, and it's always based on a whole bunch of different people's work, right? For the Nature paper on the DACA cranium, the co-authors are Brahani Asfal, Jonas Bieni, Desmond Clark, William Hart, Paul Rennie, Gensua, Elizabeth Verba, Tim White, and Gede Woldy Gabriel. On the monograph, uh, Brahani, Stan Ambrose, Ray Bernor, Jean Renaud Bossery, Steve Frost, Bill Hart, Nuria Garcia, myself, Clark Howell, Paul Rennie, Gary Richards, Haro Sagusa, Gensua, Elizabeth Verba, Tim White, and Gede Woldy Gabriel. Now, if we flip and we look at all the people that were out there sweating blood on the outcrop, Right? The list gets longer, and all these people <laughs> deserve a lot of credit, right? And that's something that's really kind of important to also think about when you're thinking about the way that this stuff goes down. Now, I don't have any fun that you can contribute to or anything, so I'm not plugging that, but it's hard to do this work, and it turns out that there's not a lot of different organizations that are interested in funding it. I mean, why? It seems like it's pretty fundamental to our understanding of our place in nature and all the stuff going on in the world, but, you know, it's not funded, it's not really all that well funded. And what that means is that all these people who are going out are doing it without being paid, right? They're just doing it like that, just because they think it's gonna make the world a better place. And you know, we do end up getting jobs in universities and going around and talking and stuff like that, but you know, they deserve credit for that. So um, finally, I guess we do have to talk a little bit about the sponsors, National Science Foundation, Leakey Foundation, the Middle Isle Wash Project. You're gonna be hearing from Tim White in a little while on the early stuff. Um, and also the Authority for Research and Conservation of Cultural Heritage in Ethiopia, which is in the Ministry of Youth, Sports, and Culture. It's really important also to emphasize uh, the role that Ethiopia has played. Ethiopia is really different from what you find in a lot of uh, former colonies in Africa, where uh, the culture has been kind of disrupted by the colonialization, by, by the colonies, and you have um, a real different mentality inside of Ethiopia. Inside of Ethiopia, when you start working with people, you're just working with people, right? There's no like this kind of uh, weird, edgy uh, distinction between Western Europe and the people that are working there that is a, that is a legacy of colonialism. Um, the other thing that you find in Ethiopia that's really different from the rest of, well, from the rest of colonial Africa uh, is that corruption is less, right? In most places, you have to pay, not like officially, you have to pay people under the table the whole time that you're working there. I won't do it. It's not like that in Ethiopia. There's a lot of pride and a lot of people that, that are actually trying to develop something there for an internal cultural reason, right? So it's important to recognize that. And uh, I would suggest that you go there if for nothing else than to go and check out Lali Bella. Um, Human Evolution Research Center at UC Berkeley has also provided a lot of support to me over the years. So we gotta thank those guys. Um, finally, my co-author Brahani Asfau has uh, been with me the whole time, and actually, you know, the two of us have been really sort of closely collaborating on DACA from the very beginning. And I guess the final thing that I got to do is thank all you guys. I think that's the last slide that I got to bore you with. Oh no, I've got one more, and this one's actually the most important one. Um, this is Desmond Clark and John DeHeinslin. Uh, Desmond Clark fought uh, in World War II in Ethiopia and he was looking for archeology span at the same time that he was fighting the Italians. And one of the things that uh, uh, he realized, and in part what happened in Ethiopia has to do with his vision as well, right? The, uh, the, the way that paleoanthropology emerged inside of Ethiopia, the way that I described it being different from a lot of the other part of Eastern Eurasia, has a lot to do with uh, the vision that this guy had. Um, he saw that there was gonna be a whole bunch of fossils, and he had also seen what happened in Kenya and Tanzania, and he didn't let that go down. Jean de Heinzlin is a, is, a, is a good old friend. He passed away some time ago, but uh, he's the one who did all the geology for the Bori Peninsula early on, and sort of taught me how to do field geology. So I bored you a lot with all those different uh, acknowledgements and everything like that. Thanks for sitting through it, and we've got plenty of time for questions, so uh, we can open it up like that. Yeah? All right. <laughs>